So you're very lucky that I'm bothering to do this this evening because I got an email earlier today telling me I'd won two million rand and frankly I'm doing this just because I love it not for the money because the big bucks are coming my way because I got the email. My name is Bruce Whitfield this is tonight and it's really good to be with you. I'm joined by Danny Myberg who is a computer forensic expert who may be about to burst my bubble because he runs the computer forensic lab. Am I rich? Not quite, Bruce. Sorry, bad news. Uh, it's one but of I got an email and these people said that Nelson Mandela um, had left a trunk of money in a garage and if I helped them to deposit the money, they'd give me half. I mean, how can that, be, how can that not be true? We see that the syndicates are specialising in, in these type of scams. They are uh, victimising people and basically it's, it's, you don't get money for free. Uh, but, no, but nobody falls for that stuff anymore, surely. That stuff, that, that's like uh, 419 scams circa 1996, aren't they? We still see that they're successful. The, the advantage that they have is it's a low cost uh, operation for them. They only need to send out emails. They can send it out in huge quantities. But if they're sending out a million emails and they get two or three hits, they've made money. They've made money and they are prepared to take anything from five rands to five million rand. It all depends on how much you have to, to uh, how much you do have that you can donate to them. We tend to take cyber security for granted. We get some, we get some Norton antivirus or whatever the antivirus is. We get an Apple device and we believe that Apple has got really good automatic software updating systems. We're impenetrable or not? Unfortunately not because for every security feature that organizations brings out the syndicates has got the time in the world to figure out ways around it and remember they've got a very good motivation they are after your money so it's the best motivation in the world to and try that's all and they do for a living I mean that's they what they do ways for of concocting me mechanisms to get you to do something stupid online 24 hours a day seven days a week that's their function they are running 24 hour uh, operations we're seeing that these mails are sent out any time of day and night and if you click on it 11 o'clock at night there will be uh, a program that intercepts your information so it's it's a full-time job for them now in the olden days my computer would slow down it was a work at half speed and i'd phone the it guy and say i think i've got a virus can you come and fix it and techie would come in and do whatever techies do and the computer would speed up again the advancement in cyber crime has got to such a point that without specialist knowledge i'm not going to know what's going on in, behind the screen definitely we see that the software has become so uh, sophisticated that it literally runs in stealth mode it doesn't take up your resources um, i can make a video clip of whatever you're doing on your computer and email that out to me stream that out you can uh, make a video clip of my computer you're sitting remotely in remotely. albania or somewhere not picking on albanians you understand because they're scary um, but uh, you'll be sitting anywhere in the world and managing my computer from there because That's correct. you've got access to it through and, something I've done. And the scary part is it's not just your computer but also your mobile phone. So whatever I can do in your, on your computer I can also do on your phone. But how do you get access to my phone? My phone is in my pocket all the time. It's not connected physically to anything. Uh, how do you get access to it? The same way in, in which they are compromising your computer by either emailing you a link or sending you a link to download a program. But I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not going to download a link. Or the do problem I do it is they are, even knowing? they are so convincing. Um, we've uh, we've had situations where months down the line we show the person exactly where he went wrong. He says, "Now I remember. You know, I quickly clicked on this link because I was on my way to holiday and I just wanted to get this done with." You don't think for that one second, and that one second is all they need. Because these guys also operate very smartly. They're not going to, you're not going to click on a link and they're immediately going to, to go and raid you. They've got time on their hands. They're raiding guys they hit last month. They quietly saw your details, and by the time you've forgotten that you were ever on, you know, hulahoops.com, they are, are then beginning to ferret into your accounts, and that's probably when you're most vulnerable. See, the thing is, the syndicate doesn't want to overrush things. They, if they rush into your account, they don't have dummy, dummy accounts set up where they can transfer the money to. They also want to do an assessment in terms of how, when your salary is being paid in. So uh, from your history, I can see what date your salary is. And why do I want to steal the end of the month money when I can steal the beginning of the month's salary? So they take time. We see on average that after they've compromised your personal information, they wait about 28 days where they're preparing themselves before they start transferring money. Okay, so I'm a sensible individual. I don't click on links. Somebody says, hey, have a look at my holiday pictures. I don't even go there. My friends wonder why I've gone all weird. Tell me about the drive, the hard drive that gets dropped 
in the car park or in the reception area or anything like that? So for example, if I want to compromise an individual or an organization, I can load spyware onto a memory stick or a CD-ROM and I leave them lying around in the parking area, in the reception area, on the Gau train, in planes for example, chances are very good that somebody will pick it up and the average person will stick it into their computer to see what's on it or to try and return that device. Um, and by doing that, you're actually carrying that piece of malware past your firewalls into the organization and installing it for me on your systems. If I deploy 10 of them at this venue, for example, I can guarantee you within half an hour, I'm going to have at least 90% hits in terms of people that's access that. Now, the vast majority of us think, well, we don't have any cyber secrets. So what access can you get really to anything that's going to be of value to you? If you want to read my emails, you're welcome to read my emails. There's nothing interesting there for anybody other than the people I've emailed and the people who've emailed me back. That's what the majority of the people think. But for example, you can have a situation where on your computer you've got uh, pictures of your wife giving birth to, to one of your kids private pictures, private details, uh, they could be uh, personal information that they can use to perpetrate what we call uh, identity theft. So what they do is they take over your uh, Facebook profile, your Gmail account, and they pretend to be you. So I can go online, apply for um, funds from a bank. I can go and apply online for uh, items to be shipped to me. Uh, I can use your credit card information for that. I can use your identity for that. And all of those type of things uh, they misuse uh, to perpetrate crimes. But also it becomes deeply personal and there's some, you deal with deeply tragic cases as well yes. that affect families where suddenly a child commits suicide. Previously a month ago the kid was happy and suddenly the kid has, has done something terrible to themselves and parents are devastated because they can't get access to the kids devices because kids are terribly good at locking down their private lives online from their parents um, and, and you found some quite horrific things as to how criminals target young kids. Yes, uh, we're talking about cyberbullying on one side, we're talking about suicides, um, we're talking about sex, uh, online content that we don't want to see our kids to see. So yeah, we are called out uh, quite often in terms of assisting parents where they have lost a child to a suicide and because of the involvement of that child on social media, on, on digital devices, the parents are not involved, they don't have access to the device and they're literally sitting at a loss, they don't know why the child has committed suicide. And a lot of times we see that it's relating to cyberbullying or the child has been convinced to send out um, uh, explicit pictures but of themselves. this is a real world example, wasn't there a case in Vardekleur for a while back where a group of kids were targeted and they were sort of tantalized into sending increasingly explicit photographs of themselves to, to a gang. Yes, that's correct. It was uh, widely publicized in the media. Uh, I think it was about uh, approximately 21 boys that was involved where they was convinced by uh, a person or a syndicate to take private pictures of themselves and send it on uh, with the idea that they will receive uh, the so same a, material. So people say, well, I'll, I'll show you my chest if you show me your bicep. That type and, of thing. And boys being boys go, hey, good, that's a good deal. <laughs> uh, and by the time the crooks have got a full, a full naked picture of the kids, yes. They say, right, I'm going to send this picture to your teachers and your friends and your parents. That's correct. Or if the kid doesn't want to, uh, they, they were literally extorting the children. And if the child doesn't have enough money, I can always on social media establish who the parents are and then start extorting the parents. You know, which parent will not uh, pay uh, some money to protect your child against this type of thing. These guys will stupid absolutely nothing. I mean, there's even a scam involving puppies, and who doesn't want to buy a puppy? Oh yes, so the puppy scam is quite well known. Where they ask, it's a deposit scam, where they ask that you pay a deposit for a puppy or accommodation or for travel arrangements, and then they steal your deposit. Uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the level. So, I mean, organizations are vulnerable. Organizations have got great big IT budgets and they've got IT people to sort this out. They can hire consultants to come in and help sort themselves out. Can we protect ourselves? I mean, you, you make the point that if you receive email on your phone, you're nuts. Now, most people with a smartphone love the convenience of getting email to their smartphone. 
you can do work without getting out of bed in the morning. That's a positive. Yep. Uh, you see, what we've, we've grown used to the idea that we need to protect our computers. But when you have a cell phone, it's your own responsibility. Your organization is looking after your laptop, your computer, etc. Um, and people don't realize that it's exactly the same operating system, it's exactly the same device, um, and that if we don't protect our mobile devices, we are totally vulnerable. So there are definitely good software available that you can have protection on your mobile devices. Um, saying that we, we are not going to stop using our mobile devices, so we should focus on protecting them. I mean, there's a, the perception that Apple is more secure than perhaps other brands, because Apple has got the proprietary software that updates, you don't even know, in the background, that is probably among some of the best software security in the world. Would an Apple device need uh, the same protection as a competitor device? Exactly the same. What we're seeing that uh, people are downloading games, they're downloading ap applications from unsecure sites. So even though we're publicizing and saying, listen, don't, don't go to, to, to an untrustworthy source. So what I can do as a, as a criminal is I can write a small little game and I can insert my code into that. And by you or your kid downloading it and playing with it, you are actually compromising all the security features and everything because you are authorizing that program to interact and as you say updating on the background as well and while it's updating it's also mailing me out whatever you're doing receiving typing on it how confident are you online i mean because you run the risk i suppose you, you were a cop in your previous life I mean, you, you, you see bad guys all the time, you get to have a particular view of society, you've got a particular view of the way people operate in cyberspace. Do you like back away altogether? I'm totally a fundi of, of, of technology. Uh, I love it, it's, it's my work, um, and uh, I embrace it. But I also know that there are risks. I know there's risks for me, for my wife, for my kids and my family. And it's my responsibility to manage those. I can't ignore it, so I have to be aware of those risks before I can protect them. So what do we do? Do we get a, a build a wall and put an electric fence <laughs> around the top? I mean, it, it, but the software is the, is, is the virtual equivalent of that, isn't it? They say the safest device is the one that you never take out of the box, that you just leave in the house. So any device is compromisable. Danny Mybuck, thanks very much. Thank it's terrifying much. stuff, it really is. But the point is, you can, if you want to, go back to 1990 and not communicate with anybody online and go to a bank branch and, and not ever have to do anything in the 21st century. Or you can just be sensible and get some decent advice and get your devices protected. Danny Mybuck is with the Computer Forensic Lab with some very, very, very scary real world warnings about your vulnerability online and you may not even know. That's been tonight. I'm Bruce Woodfield. Thank Thank you so much for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye.